This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Sleep has been a necessity, a course, and a great pleasure throughout human history. In the future, it might also be the key to space exploration. Space exploration is a long, gradual process. Although even our earliest spaceships traveled faster than any vehicle on Earth, the distances to our neighboring planets make the travel time itself one of the hardest challenges to overcome. The distances to the nearest stars are so immense that even light takes years, if not decades, to arrive. This is obviously a problem for traveling to other star systems, at least if you want to get the original crew there. You can shorten the travel time by making the ship faster, but fans of this channel know that physics puts an absolute limit to the maximum velocity for any given propulsion system. Science might extend the crew's lifespan enough to make interstellar journeys, however, there is a question of how those years or decades of boredom would affect them psychologically. So a more appealing option would just be to hit the pause button on the crew's lives. Today we'll be looking at options for doing that, suspended animation, cryogenics, and stasis. We will also examine how you might automate the ship and the many challenges involved. On an interstellar voyage we are not generally concerned about the energy needed to support the crew. They have to stay warm and have lighting for growing food, which requires a constant supply of energy, but would be peanuts compared to the energy needed to speed up and slow down from interstellar velocities. This wouldn't apply in every case though. The energy necessary to maintain life support only drops to a trivial fraction of your budget if you're going over 1% of light speed. What's more, you have to supply that energy for the entirety of the journey from primarily internal systems, whereas your acceleration energy to speed up and slow down can potentially come from outside the ship. You might be pushed up to speed by a laser, and we've discussed various ways you might slow down without a conventional engine in our episode Exodus Fleet. Such being the case, you might find it infeasible to provide energy for life support the entirety of a journey, or may not want to allow supplies and equipment to decay or wear down. We make a lot of assumptions about interstellar colonization here, one of the big ones being that we have vastly superior automation that would allow us to create and repair fairly sophisticated machinery while traveling. We obviously can't do this now, and I don't take for granted that we will in the future. I do think it's likely, and I don't think you'd try a colonial venture to a distant star if you didn't have that ability. But it may turn out that there'd be equipment they couldn't make en route or in situ just as we have plenty of things nowadays that we can't make or repair without access to a global industrial infrastructure. Such being the case, a ship might want to minimize use of equipment and the associated risk of breakdown and decay by putting everything on ice. Consider the freighter, a classic spaceship traveling between two stars carrying perishable goods. They obviously want those arriving intact. Folks often say that shipping material between stars for trade is not realistic, that it would just be initial calling efforts, data transfer, and maybe immigrants, but this is very debatable. A sufficiently developed system, such as a Dyson Swarm under construction, could easily have a high, steady, and long-term demand for raw materials. This sort of mass import of materials wouldn't necessarily break the bank either, at least in terms of fuel. So long as you travel slow enough, you could ship things very inexpensively. You obviously still have to pay upkeep on that space freighter, which would include salaries if it were manned, and even without them, you would need to use energy to regulate temperature. Heat is not your friend when maintenance is concerned. The colder everything is, the slower it decays. The warmer it is, the faster. Interstellar spaceships probably don't need much crew during the flight. They pretty much just drift along, and at those kind of speeds you don't really need to worry much about collisions with microscopic dust particles. Very thick armor can pretty much handle it, armor probably made of bulk cargo. For moving freight, you probably got pushed up to speed by a laser, and will get slowed down by one at the other end too, probably ones bouncing the energy off you and back to collectors to recover a lot of that energy. That sort of case is almost ideal for automation, and very simple automation, except for maintenance. Of course an AI would seem to make more sense than thawing the crew out periodically to do maintenance, 
but there's a good chance human level or smarter AI will never be legal, or that its authority will be restricted, it's very dangerous and not really necessary. Now if it's regulated it means it might be a thing banned in certain places, and some sci-fi stories have used that to suggest robots would be allowed for mining in space but not on Earth, like in Isaac Asimov's various robot short stories. However, if you're worried about AI rising up against humanity, the one place you most definitely ban it is any place where it's far from people. Unlike explosives, it's the kind of danger you want to keep under your nose, where you can easily check on it, not running an autonomous ship deep in the void of space that nobody sees for centuries at a time. If you have sophisticated AI that can outperform humans at tasks like maintaining equipment, and which you are not utterly confident about the trustworthiness of, the last thing any sane person would do is stick it in charge of a ship full of repair robots, megatons of raw materials, an utter lack of supervision for centuries, and a permission slip to dock deep inside your territory. Even if you do go fully automated, it's probably wise to go the sleeper ship's route anyway, just keeping minimal automation online most of the time with a more sophisticated AI that wakes up briefly for scheduled maintenance or emergencies. The whole point of AI at the human or higher level is to enable them to be creative and adaptable, which means that the more time it has to sit by itself thinking, the more likely it is to engage in or adapt to some new way of thinking. In general, I'd be particularly worried about what anyone in isolation will come up with too, not just an inhuman intelligence. We talked about cultural shifting on very long voyages last time in the series, in the arc of a million years. If you've got a really long voyage, there's a lot to be said about keeping the crew on ice as much as possible, and certainly the passengers. That way it is your original crew showing up, which won't be the case otherwise, even if they are all biologically immortal and don't have any kids during the trip. They are still not really the same people as the ones who left. I can send folks on a mission for a few years and they will come back very different, push that up to centuries and that change will be vastly larger. Now it's worth noting that most probably the same technology that lets you freeze and thaw people is what's needed to make someone biologically immortal, and we'll talk about why in a moment, but if that's the case you don't need to freeze them to let them make the journey intact. You might still want to so that they aren't experiencing the trip with all the potential boredom and mutation of mind that implies, also probably the salary. We probably don't have to pay colonists, you would have to compensate freight crews I'd think, and you might get away with paying less if they are sleeping most of the way. Being the crew of a sleeper ship is either an awesome experience or a particularly brutal form of torture, same as freezing someone and waking them up centuries later a popular if bizarre punishment in a lot of science fiction. You're essentially kicking someone ahead to a time when their family and friends are dead and the culture they knew is radically different, that's presumably the punishment angle, but of course you've not in any way rehabilitated them or otherwise punished them. And that's a very subjective punishment, many people would cheerfully pay money for a trip to the future, even a one-way trip, and while I hate to generalize, There are people who don't really care much about their friends and family, and I suspect there's a decent correlation between them and the sorts who would be getting convicted of the sorts of crimes heinous enough to be dumped into carbonite over. Probably a thing to keep in mind when picking crews too, while most who sign up for a century long trip as a popsicle are unlikely to be monsters, you do need to consider the basic mindset of anyone willing to sever ties with home forever. That's less a concern for colonists who would ought to be taking their families with them and going out to build a new world, but for a freighter it probably won't be about pioneering spirit or simply wanderlust, since this isn't going backpacking for a year in another country or enlisting for a term with the military or signing on to crew a merchant ship to distant ports of call, or rather it's exactly that last one but with very distant ports where you're not coming home to find some changes and maybe one or two friends or family members married, born, divorced, moved, or dead. For such voyages, even the short trips will be like leaving during the Renaissance and returning home to the here and now. It is, in a sense, one-way time travel. 
I don't doubt you'd find many volunteers, for the same reason I'd imagine they could sell their cargo too, and even with our current population and screening out the mentally unstable, I'm sure we could find thousands of volunteers and also thousands of people who would pay a fortune for a bottle of wine grown on an alien planet or even just a random rock. Your typical civilization, capable of mundane interstellar travel, probably has a population many orders of magnitude higher to select from, and to sell too. You could still crew the ships with families as well, and after a bit the crew becomes your real family anyway as you leapfrog ahead down the centuries, and if someone decides to leave, odds are you'd find someone else at that port who either wanted to try it out, or who had already done it many times but either changed ships or took a break from it for a while. You could easily get your own subculture from this, something Alastair Reynolds works with in many of his novels, such as the Ultras from the Revelation Space series, a group of mostly cyborgs who roam from system to system and add a new braid to their hair for every voyage they make, or the various Shadowling families from the House of Suns, a bunch of clones who all meet up every couple hundred thousand years to share experiences. They all take advantage of freezing or stasis or simply relativistic time dilation to avoid experiencing all that voyage time, not because they die otherwise, but because they worry about experiencing all that time. Again though, there's that notion that you'd freeze yourself to avoid dying of old age, but in reality this isn't the case. You're not asleep when you're frozen, you are thoroughly dead. These are truly tomb ships not a place where folks actually sleep, and that probably is not a semantic difference. When we free someone they are obviously dead now, but to wake them up we essentially have to reconstruct all their cells. We are not trying to freeze them to avoid cell destruction so we can just warm them up either. We freeze them so that destruction is rebuildable, like carefully disassembling a house brick by brick while cataloging where each one was. That's why the process is a lot more complex than just dumping someone in a vat of liquid nitrogen, and why modern methods usually only bother with the head. We know we can't thaw any of those folks out until we have the technology to replace their body anyway. In theory, you can come up with ways to freeze and thaw people that wouldn't necessarily mandate you also had life extension technology. Such processes would likely involve genetically re-engineering people or use some process more akin to the carbonite treatment Han Solo got in Empire Strikes Back, or some equivalent to plastination, which we sometimes do to biological samples or corpses, replace waters and lipids with polymers, though presumably in a reversible fashion. With actual freezing you have to worry about your cells exploding, so we could imagine some material essentially inserting itself to carefully pad and protect the interior of every cell that could be purged later on. We could also genetically engineer ourselves to have cellular repair mechanisms and antifreeze by default in our cells, much as some fish in Antarctica or some amphibians like the Alaskan wood frog. We could even modify our bodies to tolerate a certain amount of dehydration, allowing ice crystals to form without causing cell damage as many insects do in order to overwinter. It's not like there's a lack of walking examples in nature we can copy, each of which offers distinct advantages. I should note that nature gives us a warning about this too, hibernation strategies are very risky in nature, and are only ever employed when there is no other viable survival strategy available. The same may apply to using this for space travel. This concept though isn't just limited to making corpsicles, again an AI might be a sleeper crew by only booting up periodically, and people who have gone the cyborg route might do the same, either through something akin to suspended animation or by slowing down their subjective experience of time. Interestingly, a cyborg might actually be someone you could speak to quickly if they were frozen. If hypothermia is anything to go by, you need at least a day to bring someone safely back up from the lowest body core temperatures anyone has survived, which were still well above freezing, let alone liquid nitrogen temperatures. So waking anyone in under a day would seem unlikely, and we could be talking about weeks. On the other hand, some cyborg or transhuman with a lot of mental augmentation, usually assumed to involve having your neurons replaced or subsidized by various metal conductors, which typically conduct better the colder you get, 
might be someone you could chat with while they were frozen. In fiction, frozen crew members often get woken up for an emergency, either the whole crew was on ice with an automated system to wake them up if something occurred, or someone with a special skill set gets woken because of some unexpected event they are best qualified for. In practice that could only really be done if it was a long term kind of crisis. An example would be finding out your destination system for a colony ship wasn't what you expected, so you wake the astrobiologist to review the data on alternate planets you can divert to, a decision you likely have months to decide about. It's also worth considering that you might not be shipping whole people, but just their heads. Most folks who get frozen these days just do their head, not their whole body, and while that's often because they actually died first of some ailment that would require a new body anyway, it's unlikely to be a sticking point. I've seriously considered cryo as opposed to burial or cremation, and probably would do it one day, and I'd prefer my whole body be frozen but I don't really much care, and most folks I know who contemplate doing it don't seem to either. So it might not be a ship full of frozen bodies, corpsicles, but just a bunch of frozen heads. I've also noticed most of us who are fine with being frozen are generally more okay with the notion of being a cyborg too, which would imply a decent chance any frozen crew woken up for routine maintenance activities might just be activated, body or brain still frozen, but conscious and piloting a robot. To top this all off, as we mentioned earlier in the series, there's quite a lot of radioisotopes in the human body, part of the background radiation we all get, only internally rather than from actual background. This is minimal but stacks up over time, when you're frozen and nothing is regenerating damaged cells. It takes a few thousand years to get a lethal dose, and you could presumably unfreeze people occasionally to get some regeneration and cellular repair during which a little healthy exercise repairing the ship would probably help too. Though you could probably avoid this, or seriously extend the timeline, by feeding them for a while in advance, with foods growing on materials missing those isotopes. That would require them spend quite some time doing that, and saving time is sort of the point of freezing them. Interestingly, there is some research that indicates we might need a little radiation to be healthy too, so this might end up being a careful balancing act. Obviously this all brings up why you would use such a ship, as opposed to run one by uploaded mines, AIs, or cyborgs, but just because a technology is available, which it might not be, doesn't mean everyone chooses to use it. Also, let's not overlook suspended animation for trips too. As best as we can tell, putting people into hibernation, with hydrogen sulfide gas for instance, really does lower their metabolism and thus slow their aging too. You're losing some life, but not equal to the time that's passed, and you are saving on supplies and energy, which currently for spaceflight is quite important. In this regard it matches the normal reason for hibernation in nature, a dangerous and desperate survival strategy you only employ because there are no alternatives. But that could be very handy for something like deep space travel, where a mission might last a few years during which you're trying to conserve supplies like heading out to the Oort Cloud to lasso a comet, or just a routine freight drop. It's quite likely, as we mentioned in both colonizing the Oort Cloud and colonizing Neptune, that both the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud will be heavily colonized and dependent on large, low-cost, low-frequency supply drops of fusion fuel, and presumably other trade goods of a non-perishable nature. Sticking the crew in suspended animation during some big circuit run from a gas giant to hundreds of habitats, where the crew goes into suspension, makes a lot of sense. They are not actually asleep though. If mimicking animal hibernation or torpor, there's no REM sleep, so presumably no dreams. Which is a pity in a way, as one might imagine using mind augmentation to allow shared dream states or such, or possibly to keep brain synapses active. I suppose one might do that with our hypothetical cyborgs who could still function mentally while frozen if you wanted or needed to keep them just a little awake, some very slow group simulation, maybe rehearsing for emergencies or practicing colonization or whatever their end mission was, which might be an invasion or something. So how would you crew such a ship if you're using these methods? You could have a crew who woke up in shifts, say 1,000 people for a 1,000 year voyage with each awake for a decade and 10 people a shift. You could have one crew of 10 who woke every decade to do repairs, unless some emergency happened. 
you could have a generational crew, separate from frozen passengers, the latter making the whole trip frozen while the crew lives and breeds and dies and passes their responsibilities on to the next generation. This would make sense if you had a small but decent chance of dying when frozen and thawed, especially if the risk rose cumulatively, say 1% chance the first time you're frozen but 2% the second, 3% the third, and so on. I'm not sure why that would be the case, but it's popular in fiction and one could imagine a method of freezing and thawing that lets you a bit more damaged and less likely to survive each time. A thing to keep in mind about small crews is that it's easier for them to go nuts and easier for them to do damage if they do. You might be more likely to have a single person go axe crazy out of 20 people rather than 2, but odds are it won't be 10 times more likely and they're in much better positions to do damage, they just need to deal with one fellow crew member to have the run of the ship. So you probably need a lot of research to find your sweet spot, with the minimum risk of someone going nuts from isolation, or just life in general, and actually being able to do significant damage while they're about it. This also raises the point that a computer, an AI, while a risk for going rogue itself, might be less of a risk than a crew member doing so. Any crew or AI smart enough to deal with a weird and unlikely event might be much more likely to go off the deep end than any of those events are to occur. If you've had thousands of missions to draw data off of and found there was only a 1% chance of anything unexpected happening that a person or AI could actually prevent or deal with, but a 2% chance that a crew member or AI would go nuts and destroy the ship during the voyage, then you don't have anyone awake for the trip and just toss the dice. There's a big caveat though, if you can wake people up, and easily enough that you're contemplating using this tech routinely, potentially periodically to wake the crew in shifts or for scheduled checkups, then someone can sneak a device on board to wake them up at a time of their choosing. One can think of tons of reasons someone might do that, a group that wanted their own colony, under their own radical ideology but couldn't get funds or permission to do one, might sneak such folks aboard to wake up at a secretly scheduled time for a coup or to kill some of their fellow travelers, potentially even converting it from a sleeper ship to a generation ship so they can expand their numbers, or the crew might kill off their frozen passengers and become a generation ship, that could even happen accidentally with the cryo equipment breaking. Similarly, some enemy nation or terrorist group or doomsday cult might want to scuttle a colony ship and sneak a saboteur on board. We can also contemplate a virus that got the AI mid-flight, causing it to blow up the ship or plot a new course. And of course this doesn't only apply to colony ships, there are tons of reasons to hijack or sabotage a freighter, it's one of the few ways you might be able to plausibly do space piracy. Its usage also isn't limited to fixing problems during emergencies, freezing people is a good way of making escape pods for emergencies. Normally any pod to evacuate a damaged ship would rapidly run out of air and food and energy long before it could be rescued, but if it freezes you, centuries could pass before rescue and you'd be fine, and also experience no dread waiting for rescue. Now we've talked about hibernation, freezing, and the AI and cyborg routes, but what about the more classic sci-fi concept of a slow time pod that you just enter and time inside slows or stops until the timer outside dings? There isn't much in known physics that permits this, but it's not actually banned either. We know two ways to slow down time, traveling at close to the speed of light or creating a very high gravity potential around your ship. Traveling at close to the speed of light seemingly solves many of the problems we've been discussing here thanks to relativity, everything from radioactive decay to the need to even contemplate freezing and thawing, because traveling at close to light speed is the ultimate stasis, basically slowing everything on board down to a fraction of the time experienced by the outside universe. In theory, we could simply travel at a ludicrous speed for a subjective day and a whole light year would have passed outside. At these speeds, not accounting for speeding up or slowing down, we could wave goodbye to Earth and be in Alpha Centauri four subjective days later. The rest of the universe would see us get there over four years of travel time, but on board we experience only four days. Our entire Milky Way galaxy could be crossed from one end to another in a quarter of a century of a person's subjective lifetime at these speeds, 
This is the pinnacle of life in the fast lane, seeing the universe subjectively much faster than the speed of light allows. Of course if you did that, over 100,000 years will have passed for everyone else. This would be quite a homecoming if you swung back to tell everyone about what you saw and experienced on your fantastic journey. Not only would everyone you know be long dead, but you probably wouldn't even recognize anything as being human, because while you've been gone for half a century of your time, nearly a quarter of a million years would have passed back on Earth, making the sum total of Earth's human history, when you left, look like a blip in comparison. This is a well-worn sci-fi trope, though one few do well. Alistair Reynolds' Revelation Space series, or his novel House of Suns, are examples of it being done very well. To get that kind of time dilation you'd have to be traveling at 99.9999% the speed of light. You'd need an insanely powerful drive not only to get to that speed, but to maintain that speed against all the drag, the not quite vacuum of space, would be exerting on you. But of course every single atom would be hitting your ship at that same speed, in other words with the energy of an atom bomb. And even the cosmic background radiation coming at you from ahead would be so blue shifted your ship would be ablated like you were being bombarded with ultraviolet lasers. Remember too that as you approach the speed of light, the amount of energy you need to increase speed goes up exponentially. You also have to accelerate that whole time too, trying to maintain more than 1G of acceleration for months on end would be hard and you need to spend a year accelerating at 1G just to get near the speed of light. That's part of what makes inertial suppression fields of interest in sci-fi, and indeed since relativity tells us gravity and acceleration are the same thing, that is one plausible application of artificial gravity. Speaking of gravity, earlier I mentioned that other approach, creating a high gravitational potential around your ship. Even by the scales often contemplated on this channel, Natural gravity created by lots of mass, or dense energy technically, isn't very realistic as a means of ship stasis. Any black hole big enough to slow time significantly for those near it, without shredding them to atoms from tidal forces, would be a supermassive black hole. Considering even the normal stellar mass kind weigh more than our sun, that's an awful lot of dead weight to be pushing around. Though you might actually employ some trick like that for intergalactic travel, especially to other superclusters, we'll discuss options like that later on in the series. We did mention artificial gravity though. We have a concept on this channel we call Clark Tech, in tribute to Arthur C. Clarke's famous quote about any sufficiently advanced technology being indistinguishable from magic, and it's our catch-all term for technology that doesn't seem permitted under known science or for which there's no theoretical pathway at this time. Faster than light travel, FTL, and artificial gravity are two better known examples, though arguably even some of the stuff we've already discussed today falls under the Clark Tech banner. We don't know what folks might come up with in the future, some Clark Tech for freezing time or creating closed time-like loops at the macroscopic scale for instance, but artificial gravity is one pathway that might allow stasis fields. Gravity slows time, and its tidal effects rip people apart, so if we could make a classic flat uniform gravity floor like the one so typical in sci-fi, then stick one in the ceiling, there wouldn't be any force of gravity between those two plates, but there should be a big gravitational potential, and if we kick the power up time should slow down even more. Do it enough and you've got stasis, or ultra slow time at least. Of course if you don't do it right, you might have different rates of time flow in the pod, causing bits of you to age faster than others. The effect would be similar to the tidal shear inside a black hole, except that it's time shear tearing you into spaghetti. We do also have some quantum effects that play around with time, but you'd have to be able to entangle a whole body of trillions of trillions of atoms to use these, and we have a rough time entangling even a handful of particles essentially a similar technique to some of the teleportation methods we've discussed in other episodes. That's one last form of stasis too, teleporting someone but not instantly. You hoard them in a quantum suspended state and reassemble them later. That's very like the seed and data ship notions we'll discuss next time in the series, that basically transport information, not material. So there's a lot of ways we might do a sleep or ship, and lots of advantages and disadvantages to each method. We've also discussed the various motivations for doing each method, 
though one last motive, incidentally, would be stealth. There's no true stealth in space, but everything is relative, and it's a lot easier to hide a more compact and cold sleeper ship than one warmed up and spacious enough for a crew and all their life support needs. On the whole though, odds are pretty good the various technologies that will allow sleeper ships will also give us other options like life extension and a Methuselah ship, another topic for another day, that would make sleeper ships unnecessary for interstellar travel, but as we've seen, unnecessary doesn't always mean pointless or without advantages that might make it preferable. So I do think we will see these ships in the future, even if in some unexpected roles. So as we move into our final episodes before starting the new year, we'll be doing some improvements and upgrades to the channel. Some of those will be with our website, IsaacArthur.net, and it's a good reminder how important a website is to any enterprise these days, but they can be time consuming or expensive, or both. You still need one, whether you're a science and education channel or a growing business, and that's where Squarespace comes in. They have beautiful templates by world-class designers that make it easy to create your own website, something that stands out, showcases your work, and lets you get easy analytics about who is visiting. Squarespace aims to make it easy for you to make a website on your own, but they also have 24-7 award-winning customer service ready to help you out. If you'd like to let Squarespace help you make your dream website a reality, you can get 10% off by going to squarespace.com slash IsaacArthur. We talked a bit in this episode about artificial gravity fields, the kind of thing that would let you make a flat Earth. Next week we'll be looking at building flat planets, but doing so inside known physics, in megastructures, flat Earths. The week after that we'll start December off by asking how we might start off the real space age in kickstarting space industry. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.